button. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. So uh, welcome, I'm Edwin Rutsch, uh, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'd like to uh, welcome you to the second meeting of our 10 uh, meetings uh, for, uh, on the, for the Empathy or for the Democracy Book Club. And the book we're looking at is On Tyranny, which is 20 Lessons for the 20th Century by Timothy Snyder. This call is being recorded for educational and promotional purposes. And wherever I am is the area that's going to be recorded. So just to give you a heads up, if you do not want to be in a breakout room, we're gonna go into these smaller groups shortly. And if you don't wanna be recorded in the breakout room, put NR next to your name, do a name change. And uh, then I won't uh, put you into one of the into the room with me. So the last circle recording is online, and uh, I actually have shared that. I hope you were able to see a copy of it. Maybe share it with your friends. And uh, I did post it to the uh, author Timothy Snyder's Facebook page and Twitter page. So maybe he saw it. I don't know. Maybe hope he sees it at some point and helps uh, to promote it. Uh, so in this call, uh, this uh, meeting number two, we're going to be looking at the lesson number three, which is be uh, see beware of the one party state and uh, lesson four, take responsibility uh, for the face of the world. And if I give a quick uh, overview of what we're going to do today, so sort of a little outline. We'll show the how-to video again, six minutes, and we're not, we're not gonna show that you know, going forward uh, many more times because I think everyone will be familiar with the process so we can sort of uh, uh, save uh, time on that. And that we can uh, also, then we'll go into our breakout rooms, which will be for about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, and before we do that, uh, Glenn and Judith will pose two questions that they came up with. And then we'll come back for a 20 minute uh, sort of a debrief at the end. And uh, if time is really you know, critical for you, you can only stay an hour and a half, that's, you could leave at that point. Uh, but we do hope you'll stay for that debrief. It's always uh, great to hear from everyone uh, what their experience was. And so I'm going to uh, move kind of quickly into the how-to of the video. And Jen, if you could post that uh, link again, for any new people, uh, that's just some links there that you can uh, follow along with too. So let me uh, bring this uh, up here. The, this is the how-to video. And while we set that, while we play that, uh, I'm gonna be making the breakout rooms here. So optimize for video, share sound. And uh, this is the process we're going to use in the breakout circles. So here we go. I'm Edwin Rutsch, founding director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this short presentation on how to take part in a basic empathy circle. So next, let's look at uh, the step-by-step -step how to take part. Uh, an empathy start, circle starts with two to seven participants. Here on the screen, we have four participants, which I find is an ideal number. There are four basic roles, and the roles rotate among the participants as the empathy circle unfolds. One, the speaker, is the first person to speak. Two is the uh, active listener who actively listens to the speaker. There's the silent listeners, they quietly observe and witness. And the facilitator who organizes, schedules, and hosts the circle. Uh, they also do the timekeeping and they have some experience with the process and help keep participants in the process. However, everyone has the responsibility to hold the, the, the process and the practice. So to begin with, the facilitator will start the empathy circle. They welcome the participants. Uh, they uh, lead introductions if the participants don't know each other. The facilitator invites participants to give short introductions, for example, their name, where they're from, and something personal about themselves. 
the facilitator then reviews the empathy circle process to remind everyone uh, how it works. They announce the discussion topic if there is one. Even if there is a topic, you can always talk about what is alive for you. That is what is on your mind in the moment. And five, uh, you can, they set the speaker time limits, perhaps uh, five minutes, for example. And the facilitator then asks who would like to start the, to be the first speaker. So at that point, the participant volunteers to be the first speaker. As speaker, you We lost sound. We lost the sound, Edwin. Difficulty in reflecting it. As the active listener, you are. Just a second. Sorry about that. Somehow it disappeared on me. Where did it go? Hmm, sorry about that. I kind of lost the the video just kind of disappeared on me, but it's still playing in the in my ears here. I don't know where the video went to. Let me clear it. You want when it is okay, your turn to be about this. So let's go back a little bit. Yes, yeah, I just totally disappeared. Okay, are you hearing it? Do you hear this uh, if now? If you say too much, the listener may have difficulty in reflecting it. As the active listener, you are listening to the speaker to get an understanding of what they are saying and what is important to them. You are giving them your full attention as a supportive companion on their inner journey and exploration. Uh, when the speaker pauses, uh, you recap your understanding of what they said and how they feel by reflecting the essence of that in your own words. Uh, you can summarize, paraphrase, or even say the speaker's words back to them. Even though you may have a strong impulse to respond with your own ideas, judgments, analysis, advice, and sympathy, or, or even questions, you know, resist the impulse to do so uh, because uh, uh, these common responses block the speaker from moving along their internal journey. You will be able to say whatever you want when it is your turn to be the speaker. So if you don't reflect the understanding to the speaker's satisfaction, you, they can always say it again. Then as speaker, you check, do you feel understood to your satisfaction? If you do not feel understood, you can say it again, perhaps in different words. Uh, if you do feel understood, continue sharing. Again, after speaking a bit, pause to give your active listener a chance to recap their understanding of what you said. As the active listener, you again share your understanding of what the speaker said and meant. The cycle of speaking and reflecting continues until you as the speaker do not have anything else you'd like to say or until you get a signal from the timekeeper. Uh, if you get a signal from the timekeeper, then finish up what you're saying in a sentence or two. After you get a final reflection, you can end your turn by saying something like, I feel fully heard or something like that to indicate you are done with your speaking turn. At that point, the roles uh, then rotate. The active listener becomes the speaker. The person they select becomes the new active listener. For everyone having equal time, it is good to select someone that hasn't spoken lately, but it is your choice. The others in the circle become the silent listeners. 
This process of turn, taking turns in speaking and active listening continues for whatever time is allotted for the empathy circle. And this was uh, just a very short introduction. The best way to learn the practice is taking part and doing it. Uh, there is more in-depth material on taking part in an empathy circle and facilitating one at empathycircle.com. Thank you for listening. Okay, got that going. Um, so uh, we do have uh, two, before we go into our circles, we have uh, two questions that Glenn and Judith were going to pose. We, uh, I think they posted it into the chat too, but uh, so uh, I don't know who's doing that. Glenn, do you wanna kind of share the, the questions and uh, that we have for our breakout rooms? I, I added two also, but uh, whatever Glenn wants to do there. Or whoever, I think you're, you're a team. <laughs> yeah. You're muted, Glenn, if you're speaking. I don't know if you're... When I, I think I copied the ones you sent me, Glenn. Do you want me? I just posted in there. Uh, while uh, Glenn's trying to work out that we we have that we can create uh, we can create the three groups. Oh, you you got it. I got it. I'm unmuted now. But okay. do you want to do your two, Judith? Go ahead. Let's hear them all. <laughs> Post them all. Go ahead, Go ahead mm -hmm. Judith. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, the first one was. I'm reading it off of the chat, which went out to everybody. So I'm trying to find it here. Um, you know, what indications do you see? The first one is of, of uh, the danger of a one party system and how, how is this impacting your experience of um, the fragility of democracy, how democracy feels fragile to you? And then the second question having to do with the next chapter is what signs and symbols concern you today? And what is it like for you to consider addressing these signs and symbols as you see them in your daily life? Okay, and my two questions were, uh, what the one on chapter three was, um, <clears throat> why would a, a, you know, a political party that was supporting what he calls an oligarchy, you know, the rule of a few, have to resort have to resort to suppressing uh, voting in a democracy. And my other one was um, on the next chapter: um, How is accepting the traditional rules and ways of doing things, uh, you know, antithetical to democracy? How is it the opposite of democracy? Okay, so uh, with those questions, me. Been... Glenna, are those questions on in the chat? I did uh, post them. Hopefully, they went. Yeah, I post them to everyone. Do you see them, Linda? Um, they're in the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm scrolling through. Okay, I see it. Yeah, I'll be down at the very bottom. So yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go into groups. Uh, we're kind of at a number where it can be six to a, a group, uh, five and six to a group, or we could do four. Some, I see Jeffrey's having trouble connecting. The issue, it's nice to have four to a group so you can speak more, uh, but the problem is if one person drops out, then you're down to three. Uh, so then it's, it's, it's not quite as good as four. So I, I'm looking at four, uh, five to a group. So unless, unless there's a huge objection, if you want to try, it, yeah, I think we'll, we'll try that and see how, see how it goes. Maybe do, uh, uh, we'll do five minute turns. I, I, what? Why don't you let us take a vote? Okay, a vote. Um, okay, hands up if you want uh, five to a circle. A You're breaking up, Joan. Five to a circle <laughs> or four to a circle. Oh, no, I got it. That, that doesn't work. <laughs> this is a vote. Yes for <laughs> Okay, raise your hand if you want five to a circle. Okay, we got one. Who wants four to a circle? Okay, there we go. So that takes a little bit of reconstruction here. I'm going to move. Uh, 
So we got to move the room, gotta move some of the folks around, move to uh, four and uh, one second. And uh, do we see one more five? Jeffrey, move to four. Okay, so I think we're there. There's going to be one room with three people. Uh, and uh, I'm going to move since Larry had wanted more, so we'll give Larry more. So we'll. <laughs> So um, room one will be Linda, room facilitating. Room two will be uh, Deidre. No, no, Celine. Oh, you'll be with Celine Deidre. And then room four is with uh, Jana. And then room uh, five is uh, with Larry. So, and I'll be in the, with Linda in the in the weight room. So, as your facilitator, again, don't let anyone else into the room into the rooms unless they kind of have dropped out, and then you're just letting them uh, back in. And I also try to track who 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 was in the rooms. So, with that, we have an hour and almost an hour and uh, eighty minutes. About that's about eighty minutes or so. No, about ninety minutes. Uh, before we come back into the full group uh, for a debrief. So hopefully you've all got your books. Joan, you're going to hold them up to be our, to demonstrate the books. You there, Joan? What? You were going to hold up the books. Remember, oh. there it is. Glenn oh, did. I am so sorry. <laughs> that was your job. There we got the book. There we, so there's the book. Okay. There's two versions of it. Well Okay, and there's the graphical one. Okay, so see you in the rooms, and I'll give a 10-minute warning before we uh, come back to the full room. There we go. Jeanette, this is the and weight room. So if people drop out, they'll be coming back through this room just in, okay. in passing. So just give you a heads okay. up. Jerome, Jerome, it, say your name again, please. Jeroen. Say it. Jeroen. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Jeroen. That's with a southern twist, Jeroen. <laughs> I'm south. I'm southern. I do, y'all. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I can understand that. All right, I'm going to facilitate this group, and I've been digging for my sign, but I can't find it. Can y'all see that? That's it. Uh, you can't see it. It says stop or time. Maybe that's, I should say time. I tell you what, I'm not going to even try that. When it's time, I'm going to hold up this. And you, as Edwin said earlier, you don't have to stop in the middle of a sentence. Uh, whether you're the speaker or the active listener, uh, reflecting back what the speaker said, just, you know, finish your thought. Uh, and we're going to have, what did you say, Edwin, four or five minutes? Four or five, four, four or five minutes, muted. Oh, sorry, I was distracted. It can go five. We're going to have... There's, there's one room with just three people, so they don't they're not happy with that. But I was afraid someone would drop out, so they're going to be moved. One person will be moving. Yeah, I think last week they wanted fewer people so they would have more time to talk or whatever, so or hear their voices more, so whatever. But okay, so we're ready to go, Edwin. All right, um, I just forgot what he said. Four minutes, five minutes. Five. I think it's great. five minutes. I will start off being the uh, listener and I will uh, speak in small, I mean, ask the speaker to speak in small chunks like bullets so I can reflect as best I can what the um, speaker has said. When I finish or when the speaker is finished, when the five minutes is up, then I become the speaker and I'll be able to pick uh, or select someone to listen to me. And I guess if I understand this correctly, uh, and when we have four questions that you can pick from any of the four that um, you want. So um, 
do y'all see in your chat what the four questions are? You can just nod or whatever. Uh, they're not all together while we're sitting here. You can facilitate. Or whatever is so, alive for you. Oh, if whatever is alive. Okay. Oh, yeah. What indications do you see? The, okay. So I'm going to be the first listener. Who wants to be the first speaker? Everybody didn't raise their hand at the same time. And uh, if you don't raise your hand, I'll pick on you. Well, I'll select you. And I select Candy. <laughs> So, Candy, if you would just pick a question or whatever is alive for you uh, related to the book on tyranny and yes. Um, well, I don't know. There's so much to say. Um, I guess the danger of a one party system. I mean, there's no. Uh, there's, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I've been giving a lot of thought lately to, I mean, I'm a, I should preface this by saying I'm a strong progressive Democrat, but at the same time, as I think through the issues that we're facing, I really feel like the Demo my party has screwed up a lot. And when people who I may otherwise not really agree with point out that these parties are the same, twiddle-dum, twiddle-dee. I mean, they, they are and they're not, but sadly, in ways that have come back to bite us, they are the same in that they both benefit. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Democratic Party has lost its way about 40 years ago, and uh, we're paying for that now. Okay. Uh, what I hear you say, uh, what saying, Sandy, is that you're a diehard Democrat, progressive Democrat, and uh, you believe the Democratic Party has lost its way, uh, probably started back for uh, 40 years ago. And even though there are some people that you don't usually agree with or like to agree with, they are pointing out how both of these parties are today seem basically the same um, in terms of the direction that they're going and how they're doing it. Um, well, I, let me qu quickly correct you. I mean, yes, up until the last piece, um, they're, they're, they're still very different, okay? I mean, because the Republican Party is basically a, a you know, anti-democratic cult at this point, and the Democratic Party still has some essence of a social democratic uh, ethos to it, let's say. But what has happened in the last 40 years is that the Democrats have bought into the neoliberal agenda and all the, you know, the working class people, people in the deindustrialized states and whatnot. I mean, the Democratic Party has ignored them for 40 okay. years. It's just a fact. OK. okay. And, and so uh, that's and, and that's coming back to haunt us now. And it concerns me a lot. OK, the Democratic Party, you believe, uh, forgotten about the blue collar workers, the uh, industrial workers. And um, right now you described the Republican party as anti-democratic and the Democratic party is um, a little too liberal. Their focus has always been on social issues, but- um, No, no it's oh. not that they're too liberal. It's just that they, you know, they still give lip service at least to caring about working people and advancing policies that are gonna help people thrive and improve their lives. Okay, the Republican party doesn't even do that. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the, okay. The Democratic party you're saying gives, at least gives lift service uh, to the social uh, ills of the day and the uh, Republican party doesn't even, they don't even play. They don't, they don't even give lift service. Right, right. So in that sense, they're very different. So I don't want to say that all oh, the two parties are the same. They're not. I mean, th there's no Elizabeth Warren in the Republican Party. There's no AOC in the Republican Party. There's no Jamie Raskin. You know, so I, you know, the, all these wonderful uh, Democrats who are really trying to do the right thing. And but what concerns me is that when it comes to the uh, the, you know, they're still both serving the corporate interests. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. They are still 
both serving corporate interests. Corporate Democrats, for all intents and purposes, are just as bad as Republicans. Okay, you see that both that the corporate interest has penetrated both parties. And they are, you know, in your mind, still different because you don't have the progressives like Elizabeth Warren or AOC or Jamie Raskin, um, you know, in the Republican Party, not even a symbol of the in the Republican Party. But you, your concern is the corporate um, takeover of, of these parties, both the Democrat and Republican. Yes, I didn't, use the word, I didn't use the word takeover, take but over. I think it's certainly applicable. I mean, there's a little, you know, the Democratic Party is a little more, a, a little bit less brazen about it, okay. but, but they're not really that much better. And this has happened little by yeah. little. Finish, I'm sorry, finish your thought. Yeah, it, it's kind of happened, you know, it, it's like been a slow process, but if we, you know, if we look back over the last half century compared to, for you know, even Johnson who was horrible in so many ways, certainly in Vietnam and all that, the mess, you know, the great society improved people, those programs improved people's lives. Okay. And, you know, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You see what's happening or what you see that has happened to the Democratic Party has been what you term as a casual progression to where they are now, this corporate. Um, I, use your, I use the word takeover, that's not what the word that you use, but you agree with, that's a good analogy of, or, or description. And yeah. that since, since Johnson, the Democratic Party has just kind of changed. Well, They're not so as hard. Yeah. yeah, I would say, yeah, basically, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Candy, uh, do you feel sort of hurt <laughs> to your satisfaction? I, I guess I, I didn't leave myself enough time to uh, circle this back to the book. We'll uh, get back. Yeah, it'll come back around. So as the listener, uh, I now will pick um, someone to, uh, I'm going to speak and pick someone to, um, listen to me and I'm going to pick, um, get my clock back. Hmm. That's, that's not right. Okay. And I'm going to pick Edwin okay, uh, to listen to, uh, to listen to me. And mine is on what signs and symbols concern you and what is it like for you to consider addressing these as you see them in your daily life? So that's the signs and symbols that concern me right now that I'm seeing more and more of is uh, the Confederate flag, uh, brazen uh, flying of the Confederate flag and the uh, red MAGA hats. Those two symbols um, I see on a daily basis. Um, and they, they do concern me because it's becoming the norm used mm -hmm. to it, before 2016 before 45 if you saw and i am in the south i grew up in the south i grew up in in memphis tennessee and now i'm in texas which sometimes it is a town sometimes it's not and you know and i visited mississippi a lot but even i don't remember seeing the confederate flag as much as i see it now and i'm driving down the street and it's stuck on the back of a window or there's a pickup truck and there's a lot of pickup trucks in texas with it just flying one side of the truck has the flag the confederate flag and the other one has the texas flag and you know and it's just it's it is disturbing where i uh there's a, a main street that i can drive I, can I reflect that so yes i'm sorry so i'm hearing <laughs> that uh, you're addressing the the uh, question about symbols that are out there and the symbols that you're seeing which you're finding very disturbing is the maga hat as well as the confederate flag and having grown up in the south you haven't really seen it that it wasn't as prevalent as it is now and some real concerns about how prevalent it is yeah and um you know, the attitudes were still there. There's no question about that. But now people just seem to be, they have no reservations uh, about flying that flag and almost dare you to say anything to them about it. The other one is the, uh, the MAGA hat. 
this main street that I drive down, <laughs> it, it calls itself an antique shop. I've never seen anybody come in or out of that place. It looks like the um, Sanford Sons front yard and the flag is flying, the, the you know, that Trump is our president, signs all over the place. Um, people can tell you, oh, if you go to this corner down here in such and such a place, there's a tent set up and you can buy all the uh, MAGA paraphernalia you want. They got the t-shirts, the hats, the buttons, the cups. And we're just like, okay, you know, it's just becoming so much of a norm that is scary. It's like anything else. So it's really, you're seeing that it's really becoming a norm and just that it's becoming a norm is, is quite scary. And just wherever you, you're looking on the trucks and in the local antique shop, there's just all these symbols uh, coming up that you're, yeah, that's very it's concerning. Just, yeah. And I relate back to the book when it talked about uh, when uh, communism was spreading World War I and World War II, some Jews wore the, uh, the star because they were proud of being Jews. And then it became um became a um it used to be a badge of courage and now and then it became a target because people got so used to seeing it and it was easy to identify um you know who was on quote unquote what side and i'm i'm afraid that we're getting to that point here but we so are maybe with, already there so in germany the jews were wearing the the uh the, the star, star. And it was a sort of a sense of pride, maybe, but then it turned into a way to identify people. So there's that people are starting to be identified by their symbols. Uh, and, yes, yeah. very much so. Uh, we used to go to um, a beach, and believe it or not, there's a beach in Alabama. I can't think of it now, but it's really pretty. And so you walk down the main street of the beach, the main thoroughfare, and you, you have all the shops that's selling bathing suits and all the um, beach attire. There's one shop that has the, uh, has always flown the rebel flag in the window. We know not to go in there. We just will not go in there. We know that's a no. We'll go to the store next door, even though the price is higher. Um, and that's the way it is now. It's starting to mm -hmm. show if you're a pro-Trump and you put the pro-Trump sign and the rebel flag out there and all like that, you're not getting my business. And I think a lot of people are saying that if you don't have the pro-Trump sign, people get the business. I wore a hat one day that said Black Lives Matter. And the lady in the store, I could tell she wasn't really happy at Home Depot. And she said, well, shouldn't all lives matter? I said, they do, but the <laughs> Black Lives Matter too. You know, it's just like we have the, the label, the sign, and there we are there. Mm -hmm. So there's okay. these symbols. In my time is up. Yeah, there's these symbols. Like if you're wearing a Black Lives Matter, it sounds like there was there there is sort of this contention between the different sides, sort of a polarization, and uh, that uh, it's it sounds like it's just very concerning uh, uh, about that, upsetting, or just like really concerning and upsetting. Yeah. Feel heard. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll speak. Thanks. I'll speak to you, uh, Urim. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of what to say. Do I answer the questions or do I kind of say what's sort of alive for me? So I'm kind of playing with that in my head, trying to decide. You want that reflected back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're not sure whether you're going to like address the questions or just speak up what's alive in you. Yeah, and, and the, the topic, I guess I'll speak what's alive for me, but it's related to the book. So in the book, he says, run for office was one of the things like, in, in I think it's for the second chapter. Mm. Um, uh, can't, what, what is it? Uh, take responsibility, uh, take or whatever. So um, I am going to run for Congress uh, in my district as the empathy candidate. So I want to bring parties together. So I want to bring like the Confederate flags and the Black Lives Matter community, listen to both sides and try to create empathic spaces, for example, for, for them to decide to talk with each other. So you're considering to run for office? As, I'm going as to, I'm doing it. I'm not considering it. I you're started really? the process. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm just reflecting. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, you think you're going to, you're planning to uh, bring these different, like, 
uh, opposing parties or groups or identifications together and 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 see what you can do with empathy to uh to resolve their differences yeah and it's so it's the empathy candidates i'm going to put it's front and center empathy we listen so i'm going to be wearing this t-shirt everywhere it's going to say edwin for congress and uh i'm going to in my district i'm going to be just really trying to organize and promote that uh to offer listening to all sides and i think yeah and, it, and it, that's what he suggested in the book too yeah Okay, so you're kind of enthusiastic thinking about the idea and also the fact that uh, Timothy is suggesting it as well, kind of, kind of confirming your your choice and uh, you're looking forward to wearing your t-shirt and uh, making people aware of the empathy process. Yeah, exactly. It's a very democratic, it's almost two to one Democrats to Republicans <laughs> in this area. So, okay. but I saw there's an, someone uh, running for the Republican, he's going to run as the Republican, and he was going to the gun shows I saw. And I thought, well, maybe I can take the empathy tent to the gun shows, set up the empathy tent and say, hey, here to listen, I want to listen, you know, so I'm just starting to, you know, sort of strategize. I'm hoping that I'm going to make the announcement soon. And I hope that people will kind of come and uh, join the campaign to uh, volunteer on it. Mm, okay, so you, you saw that um, you noticed that somebody representing the, the Republicans is uh, organizing gun shows or shows around guns and you're thinking like hey that could be an opportunity to set up an empathy tent and uh, i will try to to ask around people who want to uh, participate and helping out oh well i will offer to listen to him i don't know if they're gonna help help out uh so uh he's not organizing gun shows there's gun shows all over you know the place but he's just attending one so i thought well i could attend one too you know yeah oh okay Oh, okay, so he's not like organizing the show. You're not helping with organizing it, but he's just mentioning that this is his interest. He's going there, and that kind of flagged as your interest as well. Like, may hey, maybe I can go there as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm kind of excited about it. It's uh, it's four months until the election, uh, so it's going to be an intensive four months uh, to to do organizing and and the core of the campaign is going to be the empathy circle. So I'm going to try to do empathy circles with constituents, with people in this district, with all the different groups. Say, hey, would you like to take part in an empathy circle? So what we're doing right now is going to be the centerpiece of, of the campaign. Uh, so like your campaign is going to have four months time. And uh, the focus or the main part will be the organizing of empathy circles. Yeah um so i hope you'll all help volunteer to facilitate empathy circles <laughs> because you can do it online from anywhere in the world really so we're going to need facilitators uh, okay so you're calling us and other, other people listening to to help out and they can even do it online yeah i feel fully heard thanks okay then i guess it's me at my turn to uh, to express something and Choose somebody to listen, mm -hmm. and I will. Uh, I will choose Jana. Will you be my listener? Okay. Um, so I, 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 these chapters were not really re, um, uh, triggering something really strong, like some opinion I have. But uh, one thing that I did um, think about is how in Netherlands, the Netherlands, I'm from the Netherlands, and we have elections with usually around 20 or 30 parties to choose from. And even then, it's difficult for me to choose a party that uh, that represents my uh, my own point of views, my, my, own, my own opinions. And I'm thinking about how, in, how the US can choose between two parties and still be motivated to vote. So I'm just a little bit puzzled about like, isn't that already like sort of like one thing but is there really a choice that, that's kind of something that always pops in my mind when i look at the elections in the us there isn't anything really that you um, um triggered you strongly in these two chapters but you in the netherlands where you're from you have like 20 or 30 parties to choose from and it's hard for you to choose a party 
and you wonder how you kind of wonder uh, how we manage in the United States with two parties that really seem like maybe one, like it really isn't a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Americans. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, that makes me worry. Like, and, and is there any chance for like, if people in the US really have a chance to have their voice represented by voting? And I can imagine that they just give up and don't go to to vote at all because what, what is the choice anyway that americans maybe wouldn't be motivated to vote if there's just two parties like what's there to vote for mm -hmm. yeah yeah actually that that's that's all i wanted to say actually mm -hmm. maybe uh just give some time to uh switch around i feel fully heard heard at least at least so mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's all you wanted to say, and you feel we heard, and you like to share your time with others. Yeah, exactly. So now you get to be pick someone to listen to you, Jenna. Mm. Candy, would you like to listen to me? Sure. Um. Um. Hmm. Well, let's see. There were. Um, yeah, we our two parties are really like one party. But I was a, briefly a member of the Green Party. Go ahead. You're saying that you see the parties as quite similar and that you were briefly a member of the Green Party. Yeah, I came back to the Democrats when Marianne Williamson was running. Uh, hoping to vote for her in the primaries, but she dropped out before the primaries. You came back to the Democratic Party um, when Marianne Williamson was running because uh, you wanted an opportunity to vote for her, but she was um, didn't get as far as that in the primaries. Yeah, there's... Um, um... I like this quote in the in the chapter, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll say that uh, I have a strong concern about the civil courts and the lack of transparency in civil courts. And I've been thinking that uh, maybe we need cameras in all of the courtrooms and that that would help. Okay, um, you like the quote, um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And then you um, talked about your concerns about the civil court, that you think that um, there should be cameras. I, I don't know if you use the word transparency, but you, you sort of imply, well, you're saying you need, it needs to be cameras. So you want us need more open, the people need to know what's going on in the civil courts. Yes, I did actually say that I'm very concerned about the lack of transparency in the civil courts. Yeah. Um, that relates to the previous chapter of defend institutions, but this um, eternal, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty that we really need to um, pay attention. I agree. And I also like that uh, Timothy Snyder talked about paper ballots. And I really think we should go back to, we should go to paper ballots and we don't need those, um, what are they called? Chads, they're called, those, the, the punch. We don't need the key punch, which was corrupted, but we could simply have paper ballots, you know, where you choose a, a piece of paper, you know, put them in an envelope like people do all over the world and count those. Um, you're, you're, um, a, you were taking, you were, took special notice of the discussion of defending institutions um, and relating this to voting that you um, agree with that and you would like there to be paper ballots, um, not key punch ballots. You want there to, you want to have a paper record of the vote. Yeah, Timothy Snyder specifically said that in chapter three, that we should have paper ballots. We talked about that. So that's another thing. 
and um, um, yeah, the the one party is a serious problem. Our one American party of Democrats and Republicans. The 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 I don't know really which is worse. The <laughs> the facade of concern for others in the Democratic Party or the the or the blatant um, biases of the Republicans, at least uh, these are honest and those are not honest uh, all the time. So it's a, a, we really need honesty. So you um, pointed out that um, Snyder talks about the importance of the paper ballot in chapter three and that you agree with him. And getting back to the question of one party for all intents and purposes, it sounds like um, you're saying there's one party, then you don't know which is worse, the facade of concern on the part of the Democrats or the blatant biases of the GOP. Um, at least one is honest. Um, I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Your turn. So I'm speaker again? Yes, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I was very active, have been very pick active. Someone, pick someone oh, to listen. The listener. Okay. Um, Yeron, Yeron, Yeron. Yeah, let's do it. That's good. <laughs> okay. Um, I was very active in politics um, and really always have been. I stay, try to stay informed and things, but I have to say I'm getting very disillusioned and very frightened. And um, I don't know, it, it, you know it, it should not be taking this long to have accountability for January 6th. I mean, I feel like, you know, first it was gonna be the Mueller report, then it was gonna be the impeachment, then it was gonna be the second impeachment. Now we're waiting on January 6th committee. Where is the accountability? Where is the, I, I, I don't know, accountability. I don't know how else. <laughs> To, I'll, yeah. I'll stop there for a moment. Mm -hmm, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so you're saying that you have been uh, involved in politics actively uh, as far as well, ever, you said, I think, or at least a long time. Uh, but now you look at the, yeah, the, the Mueller report investigation, you kind of, in, and, and, and all the other things you mentioned about the, January 6th, and you're disillusioned uh, and wondering when when is accountability going to be uh, happening yeah i i think the system is really broken i mean the example that's often used is that i don't remember the exact population of wyoming but you know they have two senators and california with four plus million has two sen i mean the system you know then the electoral college i mean there are all these undemocratic features that you know, we've kind of turned a you know blind eye to for for decades, two hundred you know so long, and so this is all coming back now. You know the the what's the word when something is like so encrusted, it, it it's like atrophied. Um, it, it can't you know how do you fix this? I don't know. Okay, and then sort of something about two senators in the Wyoming and the other place. That, that that hasn't been questioned or challenged for so long and it's like things are atrophying like degrading somehow and nothing happens right well the, the point is that the will of the in other words the representation that we think we have we don't really have and hmm. there have been studies done of this of you know the uh, policies favored by voters versus lobbyists versus what gets done. And it's been very clear for some time that democracy is slipping away. And it, a lot of that was invisible, you know, but um, it's not so invisible anymore. Uh, so it's like, it doesn't, people do not even realize that they're not being represented. Well, on the other hand, you have 
investigations into voters versus lobbyists that clearly show that there's a difference between what people want and what how they're represented yeah i mean i mean we have to get money out of the system that's like not i mean like i don't know like you know it, it the problem is so systemic it's like what's the first thing that has to happen to have the most benefit to fix the system and from what i think and learn you know listen to smart pe people smarter than me talk about this that you know we have to get the money out and we have to get also uh, a uh, well the supreme court we're going to have a black woman so that's a good thing but we have to have we have to get the court back somehow um i don't know i mean the thought of going back to a pre roe america is just beyond you know i've lived through too much to see this a pre sorry a pre what america roe versus wade the abortion the right to abortion oh right mm, okay and um so you're thinking about what what can be the biggest improvement here like you mentioned the uh, people that seem smarter than you say it's the money the, the money has to be somehow detached from politics at least you're happy to see a black woman in ahead of the courts. This, this was there anything else you you mentioned that I didn't catch? Um, well, just that we have to um, hopefully expand the Supreme Court. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have generations of just horrible. Um, um imp imposing on our civil rights in all different ways that we can't even begin to imagine so you see like the necess necessity for expanding the extreme court or otherwise you see a very grim future yeah i mean it may be a grim future anyway <laughs> but um if we can get the money out and if we can expand the supreme court you know maybe there would be some some hope and also elect progressive democrats where we can but that's getting harder because of gerrymandering and the sabotage that's being planned so right right so these these two things getting the money out of politics expanding extreme courts give you a little bit of hope if that can be solved and then uh the last part about um the people you mentioned i don't really have to, i feel not familiar with that so I, I can't really reflect back because I, That's I didn't okay. get it. That's okay. Yeah, Roe versus Wade, uh, Ron, is um, the right for women to have abortions. And that's what she meant by it. they're taking oh. it away. They want to turn it back to where it's illegal. That's what yeah. she meant. By it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The abortion a, issue yeah, is yeah, going to yeah. be referred, referred to. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. So now you, yeah. uh, you Ron. Okay. Ron, yeah, yeah. Yoon, yeah. yeah, doesn't matter. Um, I can choose who to listen, who to, who. yes, yeah, and uh, I think I'll choose uh, you, me. Oh, okay, yes, okay, Lina. yes. Um, there's one thing I'm not sure if I mean it's about symbolism. That one, there's one thing that, that I was thinking, what, what symbols, because I don't really remember many symbols I'm worried about, but I was, there was one thing that worried me at, at one point when I was in the UK, which was actually a very positive symbol. Um, I wasn't living in the UK for a couple of years, and that, that worried me. So maybe you can reflect first okay. this part. Okay, <laughs> you're <laughs> talking about symbols. And you don't really recall any symbols that were objectionable to you, but when you were in the UK, there is a symbol that you saw that resonated with you that was positive. Um, well, actually, it didn't resonate with me, but other people, they, I, okay, now this is the thing that uh, in um, Remem Remembrance Day, I think it's called, and around 11th of November, uh, they got the, the red poppies and they wear a uh, pin that, that resembles a red poppy flower on the lapel and especially uh, public figures and people in the press they all wear them so it's like a, to remember the people who have like made the ultimate sacrifice for the country in the war terrorism uh, they, 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 who uh, died for for uh, defending us so it's a very positive symbol but um 
it did kind of scare me like what if i um, disagree with the way war is being fought and the not being not having no attention to alternatives would that okay. be uh would that be a uh, something that would be controversial okay when you were in the uk is they call it remembrance day november the 11th and the politicians and everybody wear the red poppy mm -hmm. uh, flower and it symbolizes uh the remembrance of the people that have died um in wars defending the country or whatever and you you're wondering when you saw this it was a little um disturbing because you were wondering what would be the reaction if if you told someone how you felt about war that you think there there's alternatives to yeah exactly combat. and then i re read a little bit into this and I, I i saw that actually at one point somebody had the idea that hey we want to promote peace not war we were going to make a white poppy so so people were wearing white poppies and that caused a huge uproar in the media wow. it's like like because of these symbols like they mentioned on tyranny like the thing is not the problem it's not the symbol but that it excludes and yeah if the white poppy excludes the the sentiment of the red poppy i can imagine that yeah i can i can understand it's like it's not very uh, nice so i got these two conflicting views and i kind of I found it interesting to to notice and I, I kind of accept the red poppy and I think I see the problem of the white poppy so I'm okay that that didn't work out <laughs> okay all right so someone evidently have been thinking like you and they was like what about peace so let's use white poppies to represent peace um you know very, uh as opposed to war and then people didn't like that the red and the white because they were symbolizing different points of view and then the more you thought about it, you're like well maybe you gravitated more toward the red poppy because you were glad it didn't work the white poppy didn't work out yeah although i'm not it's like not, not like i'm glad that it didn't work out but i'm glad that nobody's wearing it anymore because it's causing so much uproar i, I still i still like the idea of representing peace but not in a like opposed to somebody else's uh pride and uh yeah and and like it's like if they see it as disrespect then even though your intention is positive then it's better to keep it to yourself and not publicly cause this uh, controversy oh so what the the reason you were okay with the red poppy going away is because the white one did too so it was not a controversy anymore and it, just because that's your point of view you don't have to broadcast it to other people that don't feel the same way that you do or that the white, the other side does. Yeah. So it's okay. Just keep it to you. If you have opposing views, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. Although the red poppy didn't go away. It's still come, coming oh, back. I the white, the, only the white went away. And I, I'm kind of, I found peace with that. So. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Only the white went away. So there is no opposing. It's just the red puppies that's out there. Mm -hmm. And you're okay yeah. with that. Okay. All yeah. right. And your time is up. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay, um, I want to speak to um, Jana, if you will listen. And everybody has so much that I just want to, you know, just have so much to say on everything. So I'm going to just try to be choppy with my uh, thoughts. Jana. So you've been listening and everybody's saying so many interesting things and you're just going to be choppy you said with your thoughts you're just gonna yeah look around. uh and the the book uh snyder and i think it was one of you jana or candy was saying they agree with the the paper ballot as opposed to the other ballots <laughs> and here in texas we're having a primary in march and they're already talking about we got a shortage of paper i was like okay i'm done <laughs> So you said that one of us uh, mentioned the paper ballots that Timothy Snyder talked about in, in the chapter. And in Texas, you have a primary coming up and people are talking about a paper shortage. Yes. So okay. you're like... Can't win. Oh. So, and then uh, Euron was talking about uh, 
our two-party system when it, in reality, we have multiple parties. We have the Green Party, the Tea Party, the Independent Party, the Democrat, the Republican. Only The only reason people outside of the country and most people in America only hear about the Democrat and the Republican Party is because they're infused with money, corporate money. So you're sharing to you and that we actually have um, many parties in the United <laughs> States. We have the Tea Party, the, um, I don't know, you didn't mention Working Families Party, Green Party, uh, Independent Party. Uh, we have uh, more parties to choose from, but the only reason you think that, I mean, people outside the country, but also in the country only know about two parties is because they just have tons of corporate money and that's who you hear about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you, yes, you, you have it. You got it. And I, for one, believe that money should be taken out of the politics because only rich people or uh, really or the people that have a lot of uh, financial backing actually run for office. So you'd like to see money out of politics so that uh, politics doesn't become it doesn't belong to the rich anymore. Uh, the way it has become. Yes. Um, and someone asked me when we were, before we got started, if I was going to vote for Beto, Beto in Texas, because we either have Beto or um, our current governor, who I, we call, <laughs> my friends call Hot Wheels now. He's in a wheelchair. I know that's awful, but we call him Hot Wheels. So Abbott. And so you, we only have these real choices because this is where the money is and unfortunately you may even though i like um better maybe i don't but i would choose as a friend of mine say i choose a cat over <laughs> abbott so she said if they put me out up there i'll vote for me out <laughs> rather than abbott so you're saying that your choices for governor are very limited in the coming election in Texas, and you have a better work or, or Greg Abbott, um, who's uh, now in a wheelchair. So he has a yeah. name. And I, did, and, and I didn't really, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. And you're really, uh, given those choices, you'll vote for anybody except Greg Abbott. And basically, your, was it your sister who said that, you know, she'd vote for, anything over Abbott. Yeah, she's, yeah, a cat over Abbott. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was, when he first ran, I didn't realize that he had money, but I should have, and they kind of tainted it a little for me. When, when Beto, Beto started running, you didn't realize that he had money. Yes. But then you found out that he had money, and then that kind of disappointed you. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, Corporations are represented before people here in America. Yeah, yeah. But we cannot, I have to go with what the uh, op in the book said, and I think you mentioned it earlier about uh, vigil vigilance is the price for liberty. No matter how, let me finish my thought, I'm finished. No matter how messed up our system is, we cannot give up on it because that's when the other side wins. Mm -hmm. So, so corporations really um, have uh, have the power and control here over not people, and uh, in the United States, and uh, <clears throat> what was it? oh, and then and vigilance, eternal vigilance. Yeah, is the price of liberty is so important that we really need to. Um, do something about uh, that situation. Yeah, we have to stay vigilant. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Diana, you get to pick someone to listen. Mm. Edwin, you want to listen? To yep, me? listening. Um, yeah, symbols, you know, I, I've lived outside this country and uh, I don't know if I should share it or not. I'll share a story about the Palestinian flag. But I, um, you know, it's like in Israel, it's totally forbidden to uh, 
show or share this Palestinian uh, flag. And I went on my own research project to find out different points of view uh, over several years, listening to people. So uh, in Israel, the Palestinian flag, it's uh, illegal to show it. And you did a little bit of a research to see what people's points of view were uh, on that. Yeah, for example, uh, a friend of mine shared that uh, they invited um, uh, Jewish people from Tel Aviv to visit uh, an Arab museum in a, and they had a Palestinian flag painted on the door before you entered the museum. And when this group from Tel Aviv came, they saw the flag on the door and wouldn't even go in to visit the museum. Mm. So one story you heard is there was a, a Palestinian museum and since they have the flag on the painted onto the door, this these people wouldn't even go in there because they saw the flag there. Yeah, they missed the whole exhibit, the whole interaction, it just blocked them entirely. Mm, so you were, you find it maybe, yeah, disturbing that people just didn't, you know, they had that block and didn't go in to check it out and they just missed the, what they could have learned there. Yeah, and I went on an adventure. I went into Nazareth and I asked where I could buy a Palestinian flag and uh, people directed me and I went and I bought a Palestinian flag. So contrary to the, how those people were, which you feel pretty good about, is you went out there and you actually uh, searched out a flag and, and actually bought one. Right. So, so I had it at home and I just kind of, um, I, I guess you could say um, artistically explored uh, my relationship with this uh, flag and, you know, see how I felt about it. And then when the only time I could actually take it outside the house was on uh, Purim. Purim is a holiday where people wear costumes. So I took an Israeli flag and put that on my right arm and took the Palestinian flag and put that on my left arm. And I wore a, um, I I wore a, a blue dress, but I had a little white uh, dove of peace that I received from a Palestinian friend uh, and Ibtisam, um, uh, and uh, I put it on my, I pinned it in front. So I was, uh, I asked people if they could tell what I was and immediately they saw that I was a dove of peace. Yeah, so uh, you, you had the flag there at home, you're kind of checking out your relationship with, with that flag and you couldn't take it outside except for this one holiday uh, where you were able to drape it on your arms and put a little dove of peace out there and, and uh, people got it that you were kind of uh, a symbol for, uh, of the dove of peace. Yeah, I had two flags. I had an Israeli mm -hmm. flag on one arm, one on each arm. Uh -huh. flag on the other. Yeah, so, so there was some balance there. Yeah. So it was a balanced dove of peace with one flag on each arm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, um, the emotions around these symbols are so intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just uh, pointing out that these emotions are pretty, very intense around symbols and their meanings. Yeah, and they can be very threatening. I lived in Austin, Texas in the 90s, and I actually saw the Klan march mm -hmm. in the capital. Austin is the capital of Texas, and I actually saw with my own eyes, I saw, I, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like... I saw the Klan march. You'd actually seen the Klan march in Austin, Texas, and it was just like unbelievable to you that you could personally still see that. Yeah. So at first, when Linda, when you started sharing about uh, these uh, Confederate flags, I'm like, I don't see any Confederate flags in New York. But then I remembered that you're in Texas. I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so when Linda's like sharing about confederate, confederate flags that uh, you're saying, I don't see any around here, but oh, but I'm in New York and Linda's in Texas. So that was like a wow. Yeah. It's, that's, that's still there. Yeah, thank you. I'm shocked. Yeah. yeah. Feel heard? <laughs>
Yeah, I feel her. Okay, thanks. Thank and you. I'll speak yeah. to uh, Candy. Um, yeah, I guess I'll follow up on this symbol uh, uh, th thread. And I see this t-shirt as a symbol too, a symbol of empathy. So uh, I wanna be wearing this throughout the campaign and uh, kind of make a symbol for empathy, uh, you know, to get the word out. So you're thinking about symbols and your the t-shirt you're wearing um, is you see as a symbol of empathy and you're going to uh, wear them, wear it and uh, have it be part of a symbol of your campaign for, you're running for Congress, is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's, Very, where do you live by the way? In California, yeah. yeah. Well, you can't, yeah, he's speaking, you yeah. So no yeah. So anyway, it is, in, and here you're, you're curious about where I am, but it is California here, uh, just north of Berkeley, uh, in in uh, Berkeley, California, which is a very liberal area. Uh, so um, there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of uh, revolutions, you know, around the world. They'll have a color, right? It's like the yellow revolution or the green revolution or or the red, or they'll, they'll have these different colors and everybody goes out on the streets that's supporting this and they'll all wear the same symbol, right? The same shirt and that same color and the hat. So there is this thing about symbols. And so I, I see the empathy t-shirt maybe as a symbol, like empathy, we listen, but it's, it's a symbol of listening to all sides, right? So it's not saying, hey, there's this bad side, there's that bad side, it's like, I'm willing to listen to that side. I'm willing to listen to that side. And I support you coming together to listen to each other. So uh, that, that's what the, it means to me. So the, your t-shirt as a symbol, it means that, um, you, well, you talked about how different revolutions have colors associated with them and that um, people come out in the street and show their support by wearing those colors and that you want your shirt to function in that way. Uh, you also opened by saying that you live near Berkeley and it's a very liberal area. Yeah, I think it's almost, the, the district is almost two to one Democrat to Republican uh, in this area. So um, not that that means anything, I, but I guess it means something, it means it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, it's very, it's urban. You know, and uh, so that's typical, I guess, for, Dem dem demographics uh, and it's a great really interesting uh, district because it's 20% Hispanic 20% black 20% uh, Asian and about 35% uh, white in terms of the ethnic makeup of it so it's super diverse uh, which is I think really cool so you're talking about the district uh, where you're going to be running from. It's two to one Democrats. It's described it as a typical urban district. Um, and you talked about its diversity, 20% Hispanic, 20% Black, 20% Asian, and 35% White. Was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There? So and there's a little variations on that. So, so, so yeah. Did so, I? I just yeah, you got it. You got it. Right. Exactly. So that's the whole symbol thing. I think it would be uh, when we set up our empathy tent, we have like, you know, five, six, 10 people all wearing empathy shirts. We have a big empathy tent sign and it really kind of broadcasts to the community. People tell me, yeah, I remember seeing that or I see you guys from two blocks away, big empathy tent. So I'm, I'm kind of into that sort of public display, you know, to kind of get the message out uh, about the importance of empathy and dialogue. Right. So you're saying that people seem to already be, there's some recognition already around the shirt as a symbol and your tent and you as the empathy candidate that you are encouraging people from different, with different perspectives to try to communicate with one another. And uh, we had sent up, I created this empathy tent and we set it up uh, here in Berkeley uh, when Trump was in office. Uh, the political right came and had demonstrations. And then there was like counter demonstrations from the left. So we're talking 300 people on one side, 300 or 400 on the other. 
and they're sort of battling it out. And we set up the empathy tent kind of right there at it. And we offer listening to uh, both, both sides to try to mediate. Uh, and I see I heard my time. But I, I actually found I got connected to all sides. I, you know, if you just are willing to listen, it, you can kind of hear all points of view and connect with people on all sides. You're saying that uh, there was a Trump rally and um, there was a counter rally. And it sounds like you said there were equal numbers of people on both sides. And you set up the tent and uh, people from both rallies came in and had conversation. And it sounds like you felt that you made some connections with people who maybe had opinions different from your own. Yeah, was that my time to hear the ring? So I feel fully heard, yeah. So now it's Candy's turn. Well, I was just thinking about symbols when you were talking before, Linda. Okay. I picked, oh, you, you want me to listen? Uh, sure. Uh, well, no, you listened to me last time, right? It doesn't matter. You can pick okay. whoever. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say when you first, the first time you spoke, when you were talking about seeing the, the Confederate flag, I just felt so horrible. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, for you to have to encounter that in your daily life is just really horrible. And I, I it's just, I, you know, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So, you know, like Edwin, I live in a very progressive area and so I don't see stuff like that. I'm in a bubble. I'm in a liberal bubble. Okay. Um, and then, and frankly, I'm glad I am sometimes to tell you the truth. Okay, you describe your where you live as your liberal bubble. Um, we're talking about signs again, and you don't, you're um, feeling what I probably feel when I see um, these Confederate flags. You don't see that in, Massachusetts, where you live in your bubble. No, but even if, yes, but what, what I guess what I was like, even if I, it wouldn't mean to me, obviously, what it would mean to you. And so that's, you know, that, that, I, you know, I mean, when I was watching the uh, January 6th unfold and the guy walked in with the Confederate, I was just, I mean, the whole thing was horrifying, but that was particularly horrifying. And again, like, I'm a white person. <laughs> so, um, I just can't imagine how painful that must be for you. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, the mag, I do occasionally see some MAGA hats and it's creepy, you know? I mean, they're, they're just, they seem like really hateful people. And I know that that's not, you know, a good way to think about it. And we should try to be open and listen and blah, blah, blah. But I have to say, you know, when people don't believe in science, when people, don't believe in climate, you know, there's a point at which it is really hard to try to listen. Okay, so you are acknowledging that the um, rebel flag or Confederate flag means something different. You recognize that it's, it has a different meaning for me than for you because of the, the color of our skin and our experiences. Uh, you mentioned the other symbol is the, um, the MAGA hats. And it, it's really scary because they seem so um, hateful and you don't want to feel like that. You know, that's not right. But when people just, just don't believe in science and don't want to hear the other side of whatever, and it, that's scary for you. It is. I mean, you know, the people who are, you know, all about these conspiracies, it's like, it's like, you know, the saying, like, you know, like it, it, why don't bother administering medicine to a dead person? I mean, some of it's like it's some, uh, you know, and again, like, I know that that's the solution doesn't lie there, but I feel like there's just so much ignorance and fear. Really, it's fear. The ignorance is driven by fear. And I, again, I take it back to the economics, to 40 years of neoliberalism, the scarcity mindset the zero sum game that we're all sold. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you um, acknowledge that, or you say what you're saying is that with uh, going back, to, relating back to the MAGA hats, ignorance, uh, fear is driving the ignorance or ignorance is driving the fear, but it's 
yeah, we don't know which one, but, and you made this analogy, don't give medicine to a dead person. Uh, but you know, that's not the solution to the problem uh, or to the issue rather, uh, that we still have to try. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what Edwin's talking about is important, you know, I, I just, you know, again, like I'm in my bubble. I, I don't get to talk to Trump voters or, you know, Republic. When I, when I was uh, campaigning for Elizabeth Warren in her first and in her second campaign, I told that I was so passionate. I said, send me to the GOP stronghold, send me to the place where they think she's a socialist whore. And I want, those are the people I want to talk to. And it was quite a great experience. Mm. So when you were uh, campaigning for Elizabeth Warren, Warren, again, you were referring back to your safe place, where you didn't, it's, you don't own, it's not usual for you to run into people that think uh, differently from you. So when you were campaigning for Elizabeth Warren, you were like gung-ho, send me to the place where, <laughs> you know, they think that she's some bad person or whatever, you know, I can take it on. And it was a good, ex uh, well, a different experience for you. Yeah, it, it was a very good experience. I was, I feel like it's one of the most important things I've ever done in my life frankly, because I think she's really, it's really important that she's there. But it really gave, but and of course, this was all pre-Trump. This was in 2012 and 20, whatever, her second thing. But the, but the point was that um, to, to be in a conversation with somebody and, and that moment where you feel like you've changed their mind is very powerful. Okay, you are, and let me uh, do this. You're saying that uh, that was a good experience for you and to be in a place where you can change someone's mind was very powerful for you. And this all happened, this was pre-Trump. This was um, right. 2020, 2012. Oh, 2012, pre-Trump, so. And then yeah. 2018 was already Trump, but yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know any Trumpers. Okay. All right. All right. Your time is up. It didn't ring this time, but you don't know any Trumpers. Wow. Okay. No. Okay. So now I have to, what's the next thing that happens? I. Oh, you, um, okay. I'm the, um, the listener. So I get to pick a speaker to listen to me. You yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna pick um, I don't, oh I'll I'll go back to candy. I, I'm gonna bat the ball back to you. Um, I'm impressed that you are willing to step outside your bubble. Especially when you uh, volunteered and evidently went to the enemy camp, Elizabeth, uh, the people that were against Elizabeth Warren. You're saying that you're impressed that I stepped out of my bubble and wanted to go to the enemy camp to the to talk to the people that didn't support Warren. Yes. Um, and if you were able to change anybody's mind, I'm doubly impressed. <laughs> you're saying that you're impressed that I was able to change people's if, minds. If you were able to change someone's mind, one person, I'm doubly impressed. Mm -hmm. And that you're doubly impressed that I was able to change, if I was able to change any minds, that, that's yeah. your impression. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to what uh, the book was saying, Snyder was saying about, or the question about the one political system. We, we it, the thought of having one political system is, is more than my brain can, can handle because I see so many negatives. Everything in the universe has an opposite. Is there is a balance? That's what keeps it balanced. And the political system, or the systems, or that have just one party, 
it's not democratic. It's it's tyranny, oligarchy. It's it's but it's not democratic. Right. You're saying that you can't imagine living in a system where there was only one party in charge and no balance. That it's uh, autocratic or oligarchy, whatever you want to call it. But it's not. It's not democracy. Yeah. And I think we have been lulled into a false sense of security that America, this experiment will go on forever and ever. And I think now the only that we realize that the only reason it worked is because everybody agreed to play the game the same way. <laughs> right, you're saying that Americans have a false sense of security about democracy, democracy. that it will go on forever. And that the only reason that it has gone on is because everybody was playing by the rules. Yeah, there was civility, there was etiquette, <laughs> if you will. And when Trump came in, it just all went to hell. The, the rules were just thrown out and um, they didn't work. Right, you're saying when Trump came in, um, there's no loss of civility, no etiquette, and that um, went to hell, and that the rules were no longer um, obey, recognized or acknowledged and just yeah. completely ignored. Yeah, because rules are made to keep um, people in, in within boundaries, safe boundaries. You can like a sandbox, you can play in the sandbox, but you you have to stay within these within the boundaries of the sandbox, uh, and you can't kick the sand out of the sandbox. Well, Trump came in and knocked the boundaries down, and then still kicked the sand <laughs> in a lot of people's faces. Right. So you're saying that there have to be rules that people behave within safe boundaries, and uh, you can work within those boundaries and use the metaphor of a sandbox that playing in everybody's playing nicely in the sandbox. He uh, ignored the rules and all and at the same time kicked sand in people's faces. Yes. At the same time, I think we have too many rules. And that's the reason it's taken so long to get some accountability for um, January 6. That I think we've created so many rules and boundaries and you have to do this before you do that, that we can't, we can't move forward. Right, you're saying that, for, I'm sorry, go ahead. Except for at a very slow pace. Right, you're saying that, well, rules are important. You think that maybe that there are too many rules and boundaries um, that preventing January 6th accountability. And um, I forgot, I, you said something else at the end that I didn't get, but the uh, that's that that's why it's taking so long. Um, get some accountability. Yeah, that's too many rules. Yeah. Okay. You get to um, pick someone, Candy. To... Let me see. And when we have ten minutes, do we want to? Um, go around and, and continue in the circle or do we want to debrief here? I'm sure we're going to debrief in the bigger room, right, Edward? Yeah, maybe at least one more. Maybe Candy okay. can speak. So Candy, you can pick someone to listen. Okay. Uh, Jana, um, would you be willing to listen? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I we've covered a lot of area, I guess. I mean, I, I can't quite imagine there ever being a viable third, even a third party candidate in the US. I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't see that happening. It's certainly not in my lifetime. <coughs> so you, you're saying that you don't see a, uh, any viable third party candidate in your lifetime. I guess you're referring to the presidency. Right. Well, I guess what I mean is, I mean, there might be candidates that are great, but I don't see them being able to break through the uh, duopoly that we have. And just, I don't see it. And I think that people are also still feeling quite burned from 
of this uh, Ralph Nader situation that um, resulted in Al Gore um, winning and then losing. Um, so I think that I don't think we're going to get. I don't think that's the that's the route that's going to make us better. So you don't think that a third party is going to solve the problem that you um, recall that uh, when Ralph Nader ran that basically took votes away from Al Gore and then and then he lost and so you don't see a third party candidate uh, being viable with a duopoly with two main parties. I don't. I think that the, I guess I, I agree with Chomsky, who I think is brilliant, that the, the way out of this is to try to elect people who are going to, is to elect progressives, basically. The example he always uses is how Nancy Pelosi wasn't listening about climate. She didn't care about, you know, she wasn't responding. And then because AOC was in there, she brought all the people from the Sunrise Movement in, and Nancy Pelosi had to listen to them. So in other words, basically infiltrate the government with people who are going to do the right thing. Maybe that's the only hope. So following Chomsky, who you um, respect very much, uh, do you think that the solution would be to uh, continue to elect progressives and uh, like Nancy Pelosi, she wasn't listening about climate change, but when AOC um, came in and brought the Sunrise Movement and started talking about the Green New Deal, that uh, Nancy Pelosi had to pay attention. Right, right. In other words, uh, yes, that's, but I mean, the challenge here though is of course, this gets to voter suppression and even more importantly than voter suppression is voter sabotage. Um, which is happening before our very eyes. So are we going to be able to bring up the turnout enough to counter the sabotage? I mean, do we even have to be talking about this in America? So you're saying that not only is there voter suppression, but it's actually voter sabotage. And, you know, how are we going to elect, you know, progressives when, how are we going to counter the, the voter sabotage here in America and how sad that we have to talk about this in America. I mean, that they're passing laws that you can't bring water to people online. Like I would so happily be arrested for doing that. In fact, I told both of my kids, I said, you know, I've never been arrested. I'm 65 years old. I don't have much to lose. <laughs> and, you know, like things like that, that are just so wrong. You know, I think we, we have to, um, show that these things are wrong. So you're really um, outraged by the fact that we can't even bring water to people standing in line waiting to vote and that you would be willing to get arrested and to risk arrest at your age 65 um, to, to do that, to violate that rule or law or whatever, to bring water to people and that you said that to your child. Your daughter and my kids, yeah, um, yeah. I, I feel a great responsibility to the next generation, um, to my kids and my grandchildren. To um, you know, when I think about the America that they may grow up in, it just—it's too sad to even contemplate. I mean, you know, we have—we've never been, you know, everything we hold ourselves up to be, but at least we were like making some effort, <laughs> and now it's like. It's now it's like, all right, well, that didn't work, you know, and I do hold the Democrats responsible because it was their job to show that government can make people's lives better. And they haven't done that for 40 years. Well, I'm exaggerating, but yeah. And you're quite concerned and upset about the world that you're going to be America, that you're going to be leaving to your children and grandchildren because um, I, and, and you really fault the Democrats for this for not um, not living up to the to the values that they were, you know, claiming to not protecting our, our rights. Yeah, okay. yeah, they kind of yeah, that's fine. 
Thank you. We just have about two minutes before we go back. Do you want to just hear quickly from maybe from everyone? Yeah. Yes, please do. Uh, we'll start with urine. If I'm saying that right, I hope. Uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, this is a check out, check in or what, what yeah, it? yeah, check deep breath. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, I'm, I didn't really, but I feel like I'm a little bit outside of discussion because it's like very detailed into the politics in the, the U.S. But I'm really impressed by your, um, like the way you deal with it. Like you, you, you kind of like, uh, like Candy was mentioning, uh, and Jenna and Linda, like how the system you're really involved in uh, the problems and you're still like seeing how trying to find out what what's the way to improve it and and then edwin is like exactly like what the book says like okay you have to <laughs> you have to do a run for office yeah. Uh, so yeah it's really uh, helpful for me to, uh, to see that okay jenna yeah i'm, I'm really uh, glad that uh that the international participation has moved yeah. up. Uh, thank you for being here, Jeroen. I think your perspective is very valuable. Um, okay, you. Candy. It was good. I, I enjoyed hearing what everybody had to say. It's very, you know, gets me thinking a lot. I mean, I'm still not used to this structure. I'm more of a freewheeling, dialogue kind of gal yeah. um but uh it's it's an interesting process and uh it's really interesting hearing what people have to say great edwin uh yeah this is a lot of fun especially when i'm jumping in the politics so it's good to hear everyone's uh, point of view uh yeah and you just appreciative that everyone when is here we're going to be closing in about 45 seconds so i'll pause there I think this was a very lively group. I'm glad Urin was here. I hope he comes back. I like to hear other perspectives from other countries, objective looking in at us, because <laughs> we can be very scary when they pull back the veil. It's not all wonderful like the media presents or we like to present to other countries. We're, we're just as screwed up it messed up <laughs> That's the but we had it well we had it well so or we have it been well until now and people are going ah we're you know, as I, screwed up as everyone else well i see <laughs> america Sia. is that is that little guy behind the curtain um the wizard of oz making all the noise and everything and then when you pull back the veil it's just a little man sitting on a stool with levers just making noise. <laughs> it's, okay. It's <laughs> uh, speaking yeah, of right. the man making the pulling the levers and making a noise, Larry, you're up for debriefing oh. us. <laughs> There's a big man. <laughs> All right. So I'll go around the screen and call on everyone and just share for, I guess, 30 seconds to a minute of what the experience of you know, an empathy circle is like with the dialogue of democracy. What's that like? Uh, start with Candy. What was it like for you? Uh, I found it interesting hearing what everybody has to say. Um, you know, we, we, we covered the questions a little bit. We also kind of improvised getting into some more particular things that we had on our minds. But um, yeah, I, I can't say I love this process yet. I find it's a little choppy, um, but I, it's it's good. I, you know, it's it's nice to know that there are other people out there who want to think and talk about these things and change them <laughs> and make things better. Not just think and talk, but you know, figure out how to um, make change. Thank you, Candy. And Donna, would you share, please? Um, well, the group had a lot to say, and I appreciate um, hearing from them. Um, I have more, um, an easier time with uh, this empathetic process when I'm listening to something personal uh, from people. I seem to just pick it up much easier and get the gist of the feeling. This 
intellectual, a little more in the head, intellectual. It, it It's harder. And someone mentioned fatigue. It gets a little fatiguing, um, especially on here, Eastern Standard Time. It's five o'clock on Saturday. Now it's almost seven. Um, so um, I do find that sometimes the repeating back what someone says, I lose my own focus or train of thought, and then I'm called on, and then I can't remember what I was thinking, I'm, which might be good. I'm focused on um, what was said. Um, I don't think it's perfect, but I'm really enjoying the opportunity to discuss this book and um, hear what others have to say. Thank you, Donna. And Jerome, would you share, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I really enjoyed the group. Um, I, I find it interesting to see this process being like not just one on one, but the way the group. Uh, I've, I really like the value of like giving people time to talk. And I know that it's limiting in certain ways, but I think especially when you have very contrasting views, then I see the value of this process where you kind of say, okay, I don't need that things completely solved but just getting at least uh, people's voice heard and having them uh, confirm that they have been heard i think that can be a huge improvement but uh, other than that i just enjoyed like listening to the people in my group and uh, yeah uh, i'm really thankful for being a part of this thank you Jerome. and stacy would you share please I, I really enjoyed um, the the act of listening uh, in my group. I, I apologize that I was too caught up in my own stuff that I was not able, but um, to listen actively very well. But uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I enjoyed the uh, being able to say what you want and then know by them uh, rephrasing it. It was more like a, like, uh, rephrasing what you're saying is to see that I understand what you're saying because I mean honestly like Judith just phrased it better than I did actually <laughs> one of my uh rants I should say but yeah I really enjoyed it I hope to remember to come up back again I, I tend to forget to come back this is like my third one but I just forget the, to come but I'll start remembering, hopefully. Thank you, Stacey. And Judith, would you share, please? Well, I think that our group was very deeply moving and uh, Stacey, uh, wow. I think we all agree that your courage to share your story is really what it's about. And if we could all, I think, I think that the beauty of it is in story and and the more we can do that and just let each other know their story has been heard and we were all really honored to hear your story stacy um so thanks yep and uh yeah and the wisdom in our group my gosh <laughs> we were talking about truths with a capital t quite a lot <laughs> yeah so uh yeah that was good it was good. I'll be back and Stacy, make you know, you got to be back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. And Glenn, would you share, please? Uh, we had a really good discussion. I mean, a lot of good points were brought up. Uh, you know, the, the uh, empathy circle model, I mean, it does make sure that you're heard i was more I'm, I'm still conflicted a little bit whether a book discussion would be better for talking about the book versus this format and it's interesting that um i enjoyed this week a lot more and there was a lot better interaction and a lot more we stuck to the book more but then i'm uncomfortable because last week it was because there were more people who disagreed, I think, with the author, and it kind of went farther afield. And maybe in some ways that's more valuable than the fact that we all agreed so much and we all liked the book so much. So I'm kind of left pondering 
comparing the two weeks were very different for me. And I'm not sure which is better for democracy. <laughs> Sorry. Did, did you say Deirdre? Okay, thank you, Larry. I don't hear you very clearly. I, I'm glad that I came back. Stacy. I hope that you'll get that feeling too. I, I'm always deciding at the last minute, can I do this? And I'm glad <laughs> that I do. Um, I think the, the experience of hearing other people processing the same um, sort of written passages in very different ways is of value. And uh, I'm gonna stick with it. Thank you, Deidre. And Leo, would you share please? Uh, we had a nice balance of two men and two women. And uh, that proved to be a balance of heart and head as well. So we got uh, deep philosophically, but also deep from personal experience and feelings. And uh, so I appreciated that balance. I like the book that we're using has very short chapters. So it's not, it's just the right amount to discuss in a, in a circle. And um, I appreciate I don't have to do a whole lot of homework, but uh, just enough to get us started. And I appreciate um, the process very much. I put in chat uh, a site called, um, what did I call it? narrative4.com in which uh, teachers learn how to pair up students who share their story at one to the other. And then you take turn, then you report the story that you heard to the class somehow. So you might check out that site. Uh, Edwin might be familiar with it, narrative4.com. And the other uh, link I put in, I'll put in the, uh, the link, there's a Holocaust Center in Pennsylvania that's sponsoring a two week uh, seminar for teachers on genocide education. But that includes Native American erasure and racial inequities and other manifestations of what can lead to genocide. So I'll put that link in chat as well. Thank you, Leo. And Joan, would you share please? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I enjoyed today, and as a couple of people have mentioned, it was quite different than, than last week. Um, but um, we, did, we did stay more on the book. Unfortunately, last week I had some kind of technical thing. This week I have internet um, problems because of where I'm located. I can't go where Edwin is in the house. And I'm going to have to figure this out because it was very, very frustrating. That was the only part that was upsetting was that um, somebody be talking and then I'd miss a word or two and then they'd come back. And so uh, the closed captions I tested in the big room, like I have them on right now, they work fine. But when you go into the breakout room, they don't work. I kept trying it, uh, but that, that's just um, a technical thing. I, I did want to mention to Deidre because she mentioned, oh, she thinks about coming back each week. Well, it's kind of interesting uh, besides enjoying the process and talking about a book I think is that is critical. Um, I've gotten to feel a connection because I didn't know Deidre at all, but we've ended up in three circles together. <laughs> and then you start feeling like, oh no, when she said that, no, you better be coming back. So <laughs> I thought I'd mention that. And, um, and my brother was in my, uh, my circle today, which was very unique. And I totally agree with him. We were all in agreement. And um, when he said that, yes, Last week, we weren't all in agreement in our group, and there is something to be said for that, I guess. Um, but I do like both sides. I think both have their advantages. So anyway, that's, that's all I want to say. But um, I think it's a, a worthy process, but it does take a lot of work to make sure that 
Um, I, I want to know that uh, we're moving ahead, that we're going to come up with ideas that are going to help our democracy. And that keeps running through my head. And yet I feel like I'm, we're going every which way. But I guess that's it. It's not a straight path. Thank you, Joan. And Linda, would you share, please? Hey, like others have said, <clears throat> this week to me was better than last week. Um, the the group, our group was, we, you know, had discussions on and were able to relate it back to the book, which I like. Uh, we may, you know, in the whole scheme of things, have the same idea, want, want our world to be the same way, but we have uh, different ways of looking at it and, you know, different approaches and different opinions. And, and I like that you know, cause I think that's what makes a good soup is when you got a little bit of everything in it. Uh, so um, it is a little, you know, sometimes I want to jump in and say something, but I'm, I'm, I appreciate the process because it's teaching me to shut up and let it be said. <laughs> and, um, and then it, you know, it comes out anyway, the thought comes out anyway from somebody else or when I get my turn. So I'm not feeling like anything is lost and uh, um, I'm really stuck. I got stuck on this symbol deal. And even when somebody was talking, I was thinking about how many symbols that we have in the world that we, we just, we, we, it's the norm. And it helps us put everybody and everything in little pockets. And I don't know if that's good, but anyway, yeah. Thank you, Linda. And Jana, would you share please? Um, I'm just appreciating this uh, book and the empathy circle process and uh, um, yeah, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. And Celine, would you share, please? <sighs> well, I appreciate about the empathy circle process in this kind of discussion that it gives us each pretty much the same amount of time and the same amount of time with a microphone, you know? So um, I think that that's helpful to help everybody feel that we can say whatever it is that we want to say. And also as we do, I think there's the possibility of going deeper uh, in the topic. Uh, I, I don't know if it would work to organize an action, but I don't know because I haven't tried that. Um, I think it works to help us all process what we're reading and how we're feeling about the world that we're living in. Thank you, Celine. And I'll just say, I love the empathy circle. I really do believe that it, it gives us a framework or a, a foundation for actually experiencing equality and freedom. Like Celine was just saying, we get a chance to experience equality and freedom. And I don't think we're really used to that yet. So let's keep going and see what happens. Thank you. Back to you, Edwin. Okay, thanks, Larry. Uh, yeah, I'll make the case, the point again for the empathy circle. Every circle is different. So there's different energy comes up in each one. And as we get familiar with the practice, next time we won't be showing the uh, video, so we can skip that time. And as you get more familiar with it, you, you kind of get into it and it, there's less sort of anxiety and it's, it flows more smoothly. And uh, if a lot of these times, if you have normal, uh, you know, conversation, you know, especially around politics, the conversation breaks down, people don't feel heard, the tension rises, somebody dominates the conversation. And with the empathy circle, everyone, you know, gets heard, more, has more or less the equal time. And it really focuses on uh, practicing Develop your ling, developing your listening uh, capability. So I want to make that as a you know a plug for the process that we're doing. And there's this group, uh, Better Angels. They try to bring together the left, political left and right. And I had shown a group there out of San Francisco how to do this. And I got this call just a couple of days ago 
guy named Carlos. He's a Republican. And he said, we had a, we had a discussion with, uh, you know, on vaccines and stuff. We used the empathy circle process and it just worked. Everything worked really well. I was just so amazed and thank you. I'm so grateful for, for you showing me this process and it can hold really strong conflict. So I just wanna make a plug for that, that you know, it, you, you can use this in, in conflict uh, situations. And in my circle, I did announce that I'm running for Congress as the empathy candidate. So I've already started the process. So I'll maybe be talking more about that in future uh, events. So uh, we had uh, five people in some of the circles because we just couldn't get, we didn't have enough. Two people kind of dropped out, I think. So we had mm -hmm. to juggle things around, but smaller circles too, gives you more time to speak and we'll We'll try to do that. And is there someone who would like to come up with two questions for next week? Uh, Judith and Glenn came up with two this week. Does somebody want to volunteer to read the chapters and come up with one question for each uh, week that you'll post next week? Can we get a volunteer for that? Larry, you're on. And everybody else in future sessions, you'll get to uh, do that to the following session. You can volunteer for that. So we look forward to your uh, your questions uh, next week, Larry. And oh, let me get the post the evaluation form. We did make it thanks to uh, Glenn's comments. Uh, it's now anonymous. So don't worry about putting your email or name in there. You can you can if you would like to. Uh, and it is anonymous. So you can say, you know, all the nasty things <laughs> that you want. And we won't hold it against you. Uh, so please, like right now, if you see that in the chat, if you just click on it, it'd be great if you, you know, as we close, if you could uh, fill that out, we'll give you a second. To, if you're on a phone, it's a little harder to do. Um, and it's also good if you can put your email in there, then we can send you, you know, uh, reminders for the next session. We love to hear the feedback, you know. Uh, how everything worked for you and suggestions, you know, any suggestions going forward. So we're two minutes over, did pretty good on time. So with that, if you continue filling out the form and we'll just do some jazz hands to get our group portrait and hey. say goodbye. And if you're a facilitator, if you could stay back for a few minutes just to, to debrief, appreciate it. Come See you next here. time. Bring Come friends, back. enemies, people you just hate, people from the other party. <laughs> Tell them to come. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye. And I'll stop the recording.